Hello, friends. Guess what? It's the year 2017. It's not the year 1967. That means you have to support all of these various media outlets and channels that you find yourself sucking up every second of the day, listening to all your favorite podcasts, reading all your favorite blogs, because the previous gate holders who control the three main television networks of the 60s are no longer beholden to your brains. And all of your input receptors. Back then, all of the advertisers that you saw on those three channels could just suck up into your nostrils, down your throat, and into your heart because they controlled the waves. Today, everyone controls it. So, podcasts like this need your support. Please go to ZachLeary.com and use the Amazon portal to buy your stuff or uh, buy a t-shirt or something. Thanks. It's all happening. 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 It's all friends welcome to the podcast it's all happening with zach leary that's me your host so happy to be here with you um last week i apologize uh there was no episode and <clears throat> it was the second time in within a, a couple weeks that there were some serious serious audio problems like the ones that we experienced in the middle of the robert thurman episode which i, I sort of fixed but it happened all throughout the last episode and it just was not releasable so uh, if there was a ghost in the machine, I, I don't know where it was coming from, so we had to go episode less last week. Uh, but we're back, episode 93, we are here now, and Are You Serious is on the show this week, and I've been wanting Are You to come on since the start of the podcast, I've known him for a really long time, and we get into some pretty cool stuff, and he's led a, a really amazing life, but more on him in a second. So you know that feeling? When you're at the edge of the cliff, right? Uh, when everything goes wrong and you can't seem, all you can see is the bottom of the cliff. When the, the, the you, ju- you just see the edge and you just see that if you fall over the cliff, this could be it. So when you are looking for progress or you're looking for grace or any sort of like uh, advancement in the middle of of uh, the, the, these difficult times or any sort of relief in these difficult times, at least in my experience, the best that I can ask for is that the cliff, the edge of the cliff, just be moved a little bit. You know, um, It's not like I can pretend that there is no edge of the cliff. I just feel like the, the edge can be just moved a little bit to get me back onto solid ground to at least take some action in the here and the now rather than collapsing and imploding within myself. So that's my situation right now. I don't want to doom and gloom it up and, and, and make things really sad, but um, um, life is really hard, and uh, I, I've, I'm, I'm in the middle of this thing that just ripped my heart out and betrayed my soul and my confidence and my heart and, um, and, and my life. You know, and when you're in those those uh, those precious moments in life, um, you know, I guess we either choose to collapse or to grow and move on. Um, I'm just not the best with these things, and uh, really, really trying to learn how to navigate throughout them. There's a great book for anybody who has um, is going through difficult times in the matters of the heart uh, by Pema Trojan called "When Things Fall Apart: Heart Advice for Difficult Times." And lots of great stuff in there. Um, but let's listen to a couple of them. People get into a heavy duty sin and guilt trip, feeling that if things are going wrong, that means that they did something bad and they are being punished. That's not the idea at all. The idea of karma is that you continually get the teachings that you need to open your heart to the gr- to the degree that you didn't understand in the past how to stop protecting your soft spot to stop armoring your heart. You're given this gift of teachings in the form of your life. 
to give you everything you need to open further. And also, <clears throat> rather than living, letting our negativity get the better of us, we could acknowledge that right now we feel like a piece of shit and not squeamish about taking a good look. So this is, to me, is always the, 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 the hardest part when you're in these situations about taking a good look. You know, I can never see the forest through the trees. I can never remove the eye from the equation because I'm in the middle of it. So my ego wants to do the dance and be the eye and be omnipresent and, and, and make it about me. I can't step outside of it and do and be the witness and do the work there. I'm at the center of it. Uh, very, very difficult place to be because you, 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 you can't see the lessons and you can't figure out how to move forward. Um, so a really good one. It's a great book. If anybody's going through something like that, I encourage you to read that book. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. But this week, uh, are you serious? First, we're going to play a little bit of music. Um. Pushing us around. Bing, bing. I will build a great, great wall. Bing, bing. Nobody would be tougher. Worse than waterboarding. So that is called President Mussolini Makes the Planes Run on Time, the 2016 trumped up version by Are You Serious? So Are You Serious is one of the great post-60s counterculture figures of our time. Uh, he, he's a, a writer, an editor, a talk show host, a musician, and really a, a, what I consider to be a, a, a cyberpunk, a cyberculture luminary. <clears throat> I came to know him as uh, the editor and one of the founders of the seminal Mondo 2000 magazine from the late 80s and early 90s, which was bringing cyber culture and, you know, sort of the whole um, kind of subtext of what the digital revolution really meant on a, on a consciousness level. And Mondo 2000 and RU is bringing that to the, to the public and it's amazing stuff. And uh, yeah, so check out everything our you's done. Um, it's a very long list. He's written some great books. Um, one of uh, my favorites called Counterculture Through the Ages, which basically takes you through a whole history going way back um, to like Socrates and Abraham about uh, the early seedlings of the counterculture, and it takes us all the way to the present. Um, really great stuff. I hope you enjoy the interview. Um, I did so. Settle in and here you go. Yeah. Are you serious? Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming. Thanks a lot, Zach. Yeah, great to great to talk to you. And uh, I've, I've been meaning to do this since uh, I, I I launched the podcast way, way back when. Um, you know, because part of my original. I sort of strayed from it in, in some ways, but part of my original vision for the podcast was about, uh, you know, the emergence of cyber culture. And, you know, from way back in, in the day, in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s, um, you know, what we were kind of calling cyberpunk and, um, you know, sort of emerging tech back then and what it's become now. I mean, my God, so, so much has happened. And, there is no other person in the universe who is, uh, you know, you've had a front row seat for all of this, um, like no other. And uh, so I wanted to start with, with Mondo 2000. Sure. Um, and, 
you, you know, and I, I, gosh, I just remember Mondo so, so, so well. I mean, you know, those magazines just laying around our house and, you know, the, the place you guys had in Berkeley and all of that, they just were such parts of, uh, of my formative years, you know? So, so let's uh, talk, tell me about the origins of it and, and where you guys, uh, you know, what was your original inspiration for kind of getting into it culturally? Like, where did that come from way back then? Yeah, I think I, for, for me, sometime in the mid seventies, I, I started reading, uh, some stuff by Robert Anton Wilson and by Timothy Leary. Um, I was also reading Stuart Brand, uh, William Burroughs, a bunch of people who were sort of techno progressive, uh, bohemians. And, uh, it, in some ways it shook me out of my doldrums <laughs> as a, uh, somebody depressed by the, uh, Failures, some of the failures of, of the 1960s, early 70s, to uh, transform everything instantly and, and easily. Um, these were novel ideas. Uh, they were kind of upbeat, uh, and they were about uh, embracing science, embracing new technology, uh, whereas most uh, hippies and punks and so forth were rejectionists. Mm. Um, and so, so I became engaged slowly but surely um towards uh, 1982 or so um i finally got uh, a bug up my ass to move to california from upstate new york uh, with the intention of starting a magazine a uh, rock band and a political party uh, all, all at once <laughs> all of it all of it based on this sort of up, up winger uh philosophy of new tech and bohemianism and well, that, sort of uh well that's left. Very, it's very much like my, my, my uh, like my, my dad's smile thing i mean that was sort of like what all of that was you know c combined into sort of one big sort of utopian idea right yeah it was a kind of, it was kind of in the air for a few people but uh, yeah. not really for not really for anybody in the college town where i was in brockport new york uh, there there was nobody thinking about this uh, other than me and a few people who i said hey read this uh, read this book the intelligence agents and tell me if i'm crazy uh well, no, you don't seem crazy, actually. That's, that's pretty interesting. Um, so anyway, yeah, I bugged out here. It took me a couple of years to get uh, accustomed to the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, it was like a, a foreign country uh, coming from both uh, downstate and upstate New York. Um, on the one hand, uh, people didn't immediately get sarcasm and, and irony out here uh, the way they do in New York. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of people that uh, – were familiar with these concepts and, and and they were around and there were uh, all these great physicists and these evolving uh, computer culture people uh, already you know this this thing was there were there was a a sense of something going on here and uh, I plugged into it and the first magazine was called High Frontiers after um, and what year was that. Nineteen eighty four, okay. and it was uh, named after uh, the space colony concept. I'm forgetting the guy's name right now, O'Neill, Gerard O'Neill. Um, but uh, it was largely uh, focused on on psychedelic uh, consciousness, psychedelic drugs, um, and uh, a certain playfulness, uh, uh, something that uh, we always maintained. Uh, a flagship of Mondo was to not take ourselves too seriously and to uh, always be antic about everything we did. Mm. Um, yeah. So, so, but like w w w you, to, uh, unpack that a little bit more though, like about uh, taking everything seriously, like, um, like, you know, especially in that time, I mean, like, you know, in the, in the mid eighties, I mean, my God, I mean, uh, America did such an about face, right. With, with, you know, Reagan sort of being the, you know, just uh, the, the face and the, almost like the, the ego manifest of America all of a sudden. And, you know, the sixties weren't too far away from that point. You know I mean? We're further away from the eighties now than the sixties were then. And, you know, which is, you know, I was just a kid then, but like, mm -hmm. I, I look, I look back on the history then and I'm just like, God, how, how could that have been possible? You know, I mean, you know, it's just so like what were, I mean, when you say not taking yourself so seriously, what was that like a reflection on? 
Well, I mean, I, th- I think it was a reflection uh, on my own tendencies as much as anything else. <laughs> okay. You know, I to decide to call myself, are you serious? Um, I had, uh, I had tried to be a serious uh, left wing radical uh, in high school. And as soon as I, as soon as I read Abby Hoffman, uh, revolution for the hell of it, uh, which also had that antic playful, uh, prankster quality. Uh, I was an instant convert to, uh, I guess what you might call perpetual adolescence, um, and, uh, you know, uh, being, you know, ha- having fun with, uh, whatever went on and, and sort of just trying to, uh, blow away people's totalisms, people's people, things that people come up with where, where they want to believe in something that's absolute. They want to be, they want to believe in the totality. And I always try to uh, subvert that. I mean, even the extent that we were influenced or I was influenced by the, what I'd call the Timothy Leary and Robert Anton Wilson uh, paradigm, I would fuck with that too. You know, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would make fun of that too. Um, and it, I don't know. I mean, that's just, uh, I suppose maybe I'm a frustrated stand up comedian <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but I mean, High Frontiers immediately. I mean, the tech culture was was right there in, in 1984, um, and we started hearing from people. You know, half the people we heard from were uh, in hardware or software mm. companies from the South Bay. Uh, they were from. They were working at in NASA, uh, yep. the space agency. I mean, they were every. Half the people we heard from were were these very active uh, people involved in uh, building things and, and creating new modes of software and applications and so forth. Um, and a lot, so, and a lot of those yeah. people too. I mean, they were. I mean, their roots were. I mean, they they were sort of like you know, po- post hippies, you know, who sort of like, you know, they they were counterculture, but they kind of grew up and decided, well, you know, I got to find a job somewhere. And they found themselves in Silicon Valley doing that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it was a great affirmation for me of, of what I imagined might be going on back in, in New York uh, to come out here and, uh, you know, find a, a, a slow drift of uh, people from uh, the South Bay, Silicon Valley, mm. uh, coming around to us uh, where we were operating in Berkeley, California. Um yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty amazing. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, it was very mind expanding because I mean, aside from having read, uh, Leary and Wilson and Stuart Brand and people like that mm. began to read people like Ted Nelson and his idea of, uh, hyperlinks and, and, yeah. you know, how a society of mind by, uh, uh whoever that was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, but yeah, to, to hear from people who are into AI and yeah, uh, nanotechnology was just being dreamed up of a couple of years after we got started. Uh, so I mean, it was this tremendous uh, outburst of uh, things that uh, inspired imagination. That was Mar- I, there, that was Marvin there, Minsky, by the way. Yeah, Minsky, yeah, yeah. Right. right. And and I, the, the reason it inspired imagination was because it didn't work yet. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the, the truth of virtual reality and uh, yeah. still, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many of these things uh, uh, didn't develop or evolve as uh, quickly as one might have helped. Yeah, uh, I mean, that, it, it, that is a, a really fascinating part of it. I mean, I, I de- definitely recall, you know, the 80s you know, and, and sort of like pragmatic applications. I mean, yes, you know, sort of, you know, boring, fundamental, mundane things like word processing and spreadsheets were taking hold right. and that, you know, things like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, you know, video games and like, you know, and, 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 you know, I remember when I was a kid, I was, uh, you know, around that time I was, uh, I was a wizardry player and we would get on like BBS networks to sort of like share hacks for certain wizardry characters, you know, but right. like, but it was all, it, it's so much of it was novelty though, like, because it, it really wasn't even that necessary to do it. You know, you just did it sort of because you could. 
And like, so what was the promise for it? You know, it was just like looking ahead, like, oh my God, one day this could be so cool, you know? So, right. I mean, well, I mean, uh, as Tim said, you know, one day you'll be able to uh, get on a video chat and communicate with somebody in Japan. You know, it seemed like a really big deal at the time. Uh, I mean, that's one of the ones that happened a couple of years later. <laughs> a lot of ones that never happened. But, it's amazing uh, haven't, that he, haven't happened yet. Yeah. God, he was so he, he really, really could see several steps down the field in, in, in this yeah. one. Right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, High Frontiers and, and that sort of um, – wait, did High Frontiers, if if I understand, did, did it morph into Reality Hackers or was that something different? Yeah, no, it was all one organization. We kept on changing names to to avoid uh, uh, detection. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not really the most practical way to uh, run a uh, magazine. Once people know what you are, you should probably uh, stick with it. But uh, yeah, High Frontiers got kind of popular yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, counterculture publishing. We're at about 20,000 distribution. And uh, right after the fourth issue, we changed our name to Reality Hackers, and um, which didn't do as well, actually. Uh, but people didn't really understand. I mean, people didn't understand hackers back then. Mm. I mean, right now you can go on TV and everybody knows the hacker is the person who can do anything, get into anywhere, you know, track down the person who's about to shoot somebody and uh, kill him through his cell phone or whatever, <laughs> you know, on any TV show you could possibly watch. But back then, um, our, one of our distributors put uh, – Brought the magazine to magazine stands. I had them put the, put it next to like Guns and Ammo and Soldiers of Fortune. Mm. Uh, they thought it was about hacking people up, actually. <laughs> that's, that's really. Funny. They really did. I mean, that, <laughs> man. What 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 a funny way to sort of accidentally uh, attract an, a different audience, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I suppose some people into that sort of stuff would be interested in hackers as well, for sure. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> at, at this time, what was the relationship? Um, I mean, you know, this is still a little bit before um, you know we we're kind of using the word you know cyber culture, and you know, so yeah. just just right before that though. But where was this this relationship between um, you know emerging tech and sort of like um, uh, you, you know sort of this kind of collective anarchic view of how information would sort of behave digitally? How did that sit with the psychedelic community back then? I mean, I, I think that there was a great embrace, really, for the for the most part of uh, what we were doing and what people were understanding was coming from the new digital technology, the idea that every uh, every man and woman is a star, every man and woman has, gets a, a platform from which to uh, communicate their ideas, uh, that uh, the, you know, the, the Mac or, or whatever computer you have could be a... Uh, a creativity enhancer, intelligent intelligence enhancer. Um, I mean, I generally I expected the uh, psychedelic community to uh, be reactionary towards this because there was a lot of back to the land mm. kind of uh, attitudes, and and there was yep. uh, a, a, a sense that technology was you know owned and controlled by the big shots and it wasn't for us and, and we should be rejecting everything uh, to do with it. Uh, I was, I was kind of shocked actually <laughs> that uh, the counterculture uh, in the Bay area really, really accepted this at first and, and got even deeper into it when uh, we were Monda 2000 in the early nineties and the, the rave culture came on mm -hmm. and there were parties about virtual reality, which I mean, there wasn't really, much virtual reality to even experience, but people were having parties about it and uh, conferences and and so forth. So I mean, there's this incredible embrace of uh, the raw potential uh, for new communications technologies that were disembodied um, and could connect people at a distance. But I mean, there, there's also this culture of people getting together in physical space, mm. which added to the pleasure and the optimism uh, that people were feeling around this other thing, you know, whereas now people tend to feel uh, sort of more isolated and, and trapped by uh, 
by, by these kinds of things. Well, well I, I described this before uh, to some people. One of the ways to think about the culture around Mondo 2000 in the early 90s and cyber culture, cyberpunk, and so forth is that, you know, at a party, uh, the guys who run Google, like Larry Page, and uh, would be in the same room as the people who are throwing rocks at the Google bus today. You know, it was all like one party of crazy uh, uh, people, you know, uh, neophiles looking at this thing and getting excited about it, whether they were capitalists or communists or uh, rich or poor or, or whatever. There was, there was this... Uh, there was this moment where where this new uh, terrain sort of appeared in front of people, and uh, it was a less highly politicized time. Um, although, I mean, it was it was also a privileged space of mostly uh, uh, Caucasians and uh, mostly males, actually, at that time. So uh, <laughs> right, right. things have been complexified in in many different ways by uh, since then. Yeah, <laughs> my God, they sure have. I mean, I think mainly due to the, you know, the rise and you know, the 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 economy that's sort of been built around it. You know, back then, yeah. you know, I mean, it it was emerging, but it wasn't it wasn't like it it is now, especially like with with the Google example that you gave. But like, you know, I, I always thought, and I guess this is probably because of 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 Tim, I, I guess, and just growing up with him, but like that the. Uh, you know that movement was a direct um, extension of of the '60s because you know the '60s and and what like uh, you know self inquiry meant and and self actualization into the psychedelic experience was really about um, you know giving the power of the individual the ability to experience this disembodied universal consciousness you know yeah and that's exactly what you know the web became. You know, it is this disembodied representation of the human experience. And so I, I always thought it was it, it was an extension to me, um, you know. And then so, you know, when you finally, though, when when Mondo, you know, really took form and started to kind of peak. Um, and, and I think you just hinted at it back, back a few minutes ago, but. I mean, as far as I sort of remember, it was really because of the rave culture, right? Because the rave culture did have a psychedelic element to it. Well, largely MDMA, but it was music fueled and it was party fueled. But then it was also kind of embracing because of the music was, you know, pretty, you know, it, it was early versions of EDM and dance music. And yeah. somehow that fused all together to sort of make it all work, right? Yeah, I mean, for, for one thing, I mean, Mark Healy... Uh, came over from England and started Toontown in oh, San right. Francisco. Right, right, well, very, right. very explicitly with the uh, idea of merging uh, the cyber culture with the uh, rave culture. Uh, I think that people in in England, where where it was this extraordinary, you know, dancing in the streets, mass uh, counterculture, uh, were sort of dimly aware that they were that they were involved in a techno. Movement, but they weren't connecting to radical ideas around technology and connecting it to the uh, the heat, the hedonic party uh, attitude of, of raves. Um, and Healy came over. I mean, he he interviewed me for a magazine in uh, London called ID, um, and he told me he was going to come over to uh, the Bay Area to try to get this thing going, um, and. Yeah, they had meetings at our house and so forth. Um, so, I mean, it was sort of, it all came together around the same time. I mean, Mondo was already getting pretty popular yeah. uh, before the rave started in uh, San Francisco. There was something called the Digital Bean that was organized by a guy named Michael Gosney. Uh, sure, I know Michael. Yeah. Still yeah. And I think that started in like 1989 or something. Um, and, and suddenly there was a huge crowd coming to that. It was it was uh, it was timed uh, to uh, be at the same time as a big Mac uh, conference event that always took place in San Francisco. And suddenly, I mean, this thing was huge, and there were people showing off uh, 
raw virtual reality machines and different kinds of software and so forth. Um, it, it, it really affirmed this uh, sense of a merger of, uh, uh, of the old counterculture and the new counterculture. And uh, what's his name? Uh, Colin, uh, Alan Colin from, from the Oracle. Uh, the underground newspaper from the Haight Ashbury in the late 1960s was deeply involved in organizing that scene. So, uh, yeah, I mean, all these things that there was just a lot of energy around all of that at that time, and a lot of people wanting to uh, participate uh, physically in these in these things. And I mean, virtually, I don't know. I don't think that most of the people that I saw at these events were on conference systems at that time. I was on the well. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I don't think most of these people were, were really participating in being online. They were participating in a sense of excitement about uh, what was about to come, I think. And, and you know, what the digital, uh, what the sampler could do with music, what drum machines could do with music and things like that. Yeah. You know, that's, I, kind of, yeah. To- totally, totally, totally. So, yeah. the, uh, um, so M- Mondo, Mondo, though, like, you know, you guys had a really, really distinct, like, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to like be, it almost minimizes it by saying like a style guide. I don't know. It's, it means so much more than that. It was sort of like a manifesto style guide, aesthetic language. I mean, uh, like all of it. I mean, it was such like, I mean, those pages were just like opening up like this culture, you know, you were flipping through this magazine that brought you into this world that you know, so many people didn't know anything about. So like, what, what was that world? What, what was it? Like, what was, what was your guy's mission? Yeah. I mean, I remember a uh, wired magazine said, you know, we want the, our magazine to be like a message from the future. And I thought, um, well, their future was a little bit stayed compared to, compared to ours. Yeah. Um, ours was really about a release from, uh, ordinariness from, from normal, consciousness uh, uh, into this other world where uh, almost anything was allowed. You know, what is uh, the Burroughs thing? Nothing is true. Anything is allowed. Uh, and almost anything is, is possible, um, you know, all reflected through uh, a, a lot of hyperbole and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of like psychedelic uh, excitement and uh, enthusiasm and, you know, also fear and hostility in there as well. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just everything you could possibly imagine. And I, I, you know, there were, there's never really a, a, a style guide that we could send out to writers, but there was always this thing where we'd get something and we'd say, no, that's not Mondo. And it, I think the idea was not to bore anybody ever. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, 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 but that that was true though. I mean, that just saying that like alone, like that's not Mondo. I mean, that was like that was that was a real thing. Uh, I mean, you could actually, you know, I mean, Allison Kennedy, Queen Lou, and I, you know, and other people there could immediately just, yep. I mean, we both knew what we were talking about without having to uh, to uh, you know describe it in detail, which we we were loath to do anything of that you know, would uh, pin us down even between ourselves. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, what I'm, that's, uh, you know, for a lot of people who are listening to this podcast, because it's, it's been a while since Mondo's been around. Um, yeah. uh, but there is the Mondo 2000 archival project and, you know, and for if you, and on archive.org and you could kind of dig into some, some old stuff. But, um, uh, yeah, just kind of take us through a little bit. Like, what what were you guys covering? Like, what was it? T- tell me about a, a basic issue. You know, like what were what were some of the cool things that uh, you were talking about at the time? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, we, there were all these uh, sort of cyberpunk writers uh, that were getting attention at the time, so we could have interviews with William Gibson and Bruce Sterling and uh, John Shirley, and kind of kind of all reflections of this uh, sort of gritty. Uh, future world, but uh, also with the idea that technology 
wasn't about these huge machines like you'd see on Star Trek and foraging <laughs> other planets and so forth. It was about these small things that could get under your skin, you know, about genetic manipulations and, and manipulations of consciousness, both for, for good and ill, uh, both by the individual and by corporations and states and so forth. So there was that sort of thing. Um, there was plenty of just kind of relatively straightforward digital culture coverage, but it was usually about people doing things in the arts, uh, you know, uh, avant-garde uh, artists who, who were messing around with uh, tech cultural possibilities. There was a lot of coverage of the idea of virtual reality. Uh, there was this, this sense uh, that some of the technologies could move us towards a, a post-scarcity society. So there's a lot of talk about molecular machines and how uh, molecules could become manipulable like information was manipulable and, and then could be put online and, and shared. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about the freedom, uh, the idea that, you know, that, that, Stuart Brand quote, information wants to be free. Mm. Uh, the, I, the hacker culture and, and the idea that uh, anything that you could put online uh, is immediately available to everybody else in the world uh, at their fingertips. And, and the idea then was that uh, if it could be shared, if it could be uh, copied, it should be shared and it should be copied uh, because uh, otherwise you're creating scarcity where there isn't any. Now that's been complexified by uh, the ongoing uh, existence of a very uh, stingy, austere form of capitalism that uh, uh, doesn't find ways for artists to uh, support themselves other than to get paid for uh, what they do. Um, so I mean, all these things have, are, are now subject to uh, complicated uh, conversations and, and discussions and so forth. And, uh, you know, nobody's really happy that uh, Spotify is not paying musicians anything and, yeah. and so forth. So, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that was – there. Was, but, it's, but, it's hard to tell. I mean, there's there, – Mondo is such a rich stew of, of weirdness that it's kind of hard to uh, – pin it down to any one thing. I mean, there was a lot of playfulness in it. There were things, there was stuff that we just made up in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and you got away with it. And, and I, yeah. rem and I remember like, uh, you know, I, I don't know when it was, maybe it was, uh, I mean, it was definitely in, in the early nineties, but I kind of felt like there was sort of a, a peak of that culture when, uh, time magazine had that cyberpunk cover. Oh yeah, yeah. You remember like virtual sex and synthetic rock and roll, you know, all, all whatever the headline said at the time, you know. And I just remember like thinking, oh my gosh, you know, th this this thing that Mondo was talking about, and you know, William Gibson, and and of course Tim, and and now that's it. It's over. It's fucked. You know, <laughs> like it's so it's so funny. Yeah, I mean, we actually designed that. Uh, oh, you that did co that cover and and that oh. segment of. Uh, of time, uh, Bart Nagel and Heidi Foley. That's Heidi Foley on the cover. Oh, as, right. uh, I remember as, as, that. as a cyborg, as a cyborg. Uh, yeah. I mean, once you're in time magazine, I mean, the funny thing is from, from our point of view, from my point of view, yeah. I heard from more people about the Boing Boing parody of Mondo 2000 than I heard <laughs> about the article in time magazine. That was a, like a, a whole other world and a whole other audience. I, th I think it helped, uh, give the magazine credibility with uh, potential advertisers and, and right. people like that. Uh, but the kind of people who are actually already reading Mondo probably never even, they might not have ever even seen it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's really funny. I, I, I wanted to just touch on something you said though, because I do, you know, I'm of the, the uh, opinion and I know other, other people disagree, but um, you know, you mentioned about the, the, the Spotify thing and, you know, artists not getting paid for music and everything that, that sort of has happened. Um, I view it as an accidental offshoot, an accidental sort of result of the internet wanting to be free, you know, and yeah. kind of John, Bar you know, Barlow's classic, you know, information wants to be free sort of thing. Um, but you know, this was sort of an accidental 
thing that happened, you know, and, and, and for, for probably not for the better, you know, I mean, it, it, it started off. I mean, you remember like when, um, Napster was at its peak mm-hmm. yeah. you know, Napster, and it was so like, and it was kind of well-intentioned. It was just about like people sharing music and, yeah. and then it wasn't like, you know, and, and the history is a really good thing to look back on at the peak of Napster record sales were also at their highest, you know? So at, at, for, at, for that moment anyway, they, they were, they were working together, you know? So it's yeah. sort of like this anarchic version of the future was, did have the, the, these great intentions and stemming all the way back to this original, like, you know, Barlow's original cyber, uh, cyberspace manifesto and everything you guys were writing about in Mondo, but somehow, you know, it did take, you know, it did take some, some things out, some, you know, some economic pillars that, you know, could be argued are actually kind of necessary, you know? So maybe the anarchic nature of it went too far. I mean, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, it's all a matter of what kind of society we have, uh, what kind of a society we have had, what kind of society we, we intend to have, um, you know, uh, do we have a society with guaranteed income or not? Mm. Uh, is it generous enough so that artists feel uh, they're rewarded for the for the work that they do? Um, you know, uh, so I mean, we're we're stuck in this in this sort of uh, middle zone where where nothing <laughs> nothing much is fair to anybody except a very small number of people. You know, Jaron Lanier, the original virtual reality guy, uh, calls these institutions through which people's content gets shared with other people, siren servers, uh, you know, they're the sirens calling to people from the shore. Mm. They get everything. They get all the money and the people who are, uh, making the content and sharing the content don't get anything. Now in a society where money didn't matter too much, that, would not be as painful a uh, reality as it is now, but I, you know we we may find our way out of uh, out of this uh, doghouse uh, <laughs> eventually somehow. So I mean, what, what do you what what would be your comment on like I mean from a 2017 perspective about the idea of information? wanting to be free as it relates to this idea specifically though. Like, yeah, I, I, yeah, because like I, I, you know, I backtracked from it. I've changed my, my mind. Like, you know, I used to be like, well, you know, you, information does want to be free. You can't like, you know, f- files are meant to be shared. You know, that's yeah. in their DNA files and it doesn't matter what is in the file. The ones and zeros are, you know, they're, they're egalitarian. It doesn't matter. They want to be shared. But now, you know, as I see so many musicians, you know, who, who literally cannot make a living yet, thousands yeah. of people stream their music, you know? So I'm like, well, okay, well, do we have to rethink this? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we need to rethink that in terms of our current reality. I mean, I, I think we need to understand that this is a pretty good idea that uh, sharing things that aren't scarce is is a pretty good idea, but that we have to deal with the reality as it as it currently exists. Um, mm. But you know, I, I don't I don't see what the mechanism is for that uh, because you can't you can't really expect people to suddenly start paying for stuff that they know they can get for free in any great numbers. And so I mean, there's crowdfunding. Mm. Uh, but crowdfunding has gotten awfully crowded, right? I mean, it's crowdfunding has been yep. overwhelmed by the crowd that needs funding. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, there's no and and one of the one of the things that crowdfunding has done actually is it's given people who have an awful lot of money an excuse not to fund projects because uh, people can just go and get crowdfunded. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're in such a, uh, clusterfuck, you know, in general, 
politically, socially, culturally, that uh, it's hard to take any one issue like uh, the sharing of information for free and extract it from the difficulties of uh, everything else that's going on in terms of our politics and, and in terms of social anger and in terms of, uh, of uh, the concerns about climate change and, and what does that mean about the potential – uh, for future abundance that many people were hoping for in the 1960s and 1970s mm. that uh, would, would be a, a boon towards a friendly, hedonic sort of culture. You know, that there was this idea of the machines of loving grace, that uh, we would live in a sort of Garden of Eden. Um, all these things are, you know, are complicated so i mean that's the question does information want to be free do can human beings be free i mean those these are these are big questions still yeah yeah they 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 really are and and you know and i did sort of wanted to uh kind of dovetail this into a little bit of like uh the relationship between um the political ecosystem and the philosophical qualities behind information wanting to be free and as that's represented like in social media so you know the the early days you know like we the well like i know you remember the well 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 i can't yeah. I said that well 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 well, yeah. well i i i do too um you know and you know, the early days, the early visions of sort of social networks and people just exchanging, you know, kind of stream of consciousness uh, ideas and everybody kind of given a platform. But now, yeah. uh, while well, that's still a, a great thing, but, a, you know, the filter bubble has sort of accidentally sort of, you know, reared its ugly head as a result. So we have these echo chambers within our communities, you know, within the global mm -hmm. community, which, you know, I, I, you know, and I live in my echo chamber, I'm not in denial about it, but, you know, I don't know, you know, if there's a mechanism to fix this either, but I, I, I feel like what started off as this great form that enabled people to talk to each other and get their own ideas out has become people actually not talking to each other. <laughs> you know, we're only talking to ourselves. So I, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm being too cynical, but I, I just feel like a little bit of that original sort of like the beauty of the anarchic vision of the early days has sort of gotten lost and can created some separation. Yeah, I mean, there, there was this whole uh, Teilhard de Chardin uh, notion of the, of the global brain, the universal brain, and uh, yeah. all our minds would uh, be able to communicate one to one with uh, one another, and uh, I, I don't want to know what's in most people's minds that I see on Facebook or uh, Twitter or uh, what, whatever. Uh, you know, we don't we actually don't like each other's minds that much for the most part. Uh, you know, and I, again, that's a reflection of uh, the, the society that we're in at the moment and, and the uh, wide scale dissatisfaction that people feel about their own lives that they then uh, manage to express usually stupidly and ignorantly uh, in ways on the internet. Now, one of the ideas, uh, and that's an idea that's still out there, is that, uh, I mean, that disembodied minds using text uh, and so forth might be mean might be meaner than embodied minds. You might be meaner to somebody <laughs> at a distance than yes. you are when, when they're right there in front of you. Uh, but maybe that this in-between state of uh, people start entering uh, uh, fully uh, saturated three-dimensional virtual realities, uh, that might bring a little bit of uh, – uh, of the uh, emotional intelligence back into play. I mean, there's no, certainly not, no guarantee of that. I'm sure plenty of horrors will uh, take place there, but uh, uh, there, there might be a tendency to uh, uh, feel more empathy for people uh, in, in, for other people in, in those kinds of situations. Um, huh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Do you, do you, 
I, I, I'm just wondering if that if 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 that feels true. I mean, because I, I, I do feel like the, the empathetic thing is sort of uh, it's a it's a big question mark, right? Well, it's a, it's a driver right now of a lot of stuff that people are creating for virtual reality, um, where, where they're trying to get people to experience uh, things that are difficult uh, from the point of view of other people. There are a number of art projects like that. And uh, from the experimentation so far, I mean, when, when there's an intention to sensitize people, um, then that can be very effective. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, it'll probably be an entertainment medium, and we love really intense, vile, violent forms of entertainment so that might come along and once again desensitize people so you know yeah <laughs> yeah 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 that's that's so what you know through, through this sort of uh you know this is this kind of feels like we're in the middle of like a cultural schism right now yeah uh, yeah you know where there is just some some kind of dissonance that who the fuck knows how it's going to work itself how i honestly have yeah. no idea but where does the counterculture lie right now? What is the current state of the counterculture? Well, and when I did my book, uh, Counterculture Through the Ages, with yeah. uh, Darren Joy. And I want to talk and, about that. Yeah. yeah, in 2004, at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, I asked, is counterculture really counter anymore? And uh, there's mm. the question of whether there's a solid enough uh, consensus reality, uh, uh, a solid enough center, a, a solid enough sense of what the culture itself is to really be able to have a counterculture that's, that's uh, distinct from that. And I mean, there, there was always, uh, it was always a tug of war. I mean, the counterculture was never uh, this complete autonomous zone yeah. in which people were not participants in American uh, or uh, European or wherever those societies, they were part of it. Uh, that There was a mutual parasitism going on between counterculture and mainstream culture to both good and, and, and bad effect. So, I mean, is there counterculture now? Mm. Um, there's uh, a multiplicity of uh, subcultures and, you know, many cultures in which people seem to reflect the styles and attitudes of uh, you know hippie cultures and punk cultures and so forth, and there's Burning Burning Man, and you know some of the enthusiasm for that starts to dissipate after a while. Mm. Uh, anything that's, I mean, one of one of Tim Leary's points in uh, the introduction to counterculture through the ages is that uh, countercultures should flare up and then they should they should sort of dissipate. That anything that's been around too long becomes uh, a little bit uh, solidified and, and you know uh, sclerotic and so forth. Um, so we got now. Who, who's to say? And there's there's a big thing now with uh, people who who are part of the so-called alt right claiming that they're a real counterculture uh, because you know liberalism. Uh, the cultural attitudes of liberalism has become such a uh, pressure mm. on people that uh, the way to revolt is to become an asshole. Or no, I mean to become a. Uh, yeah, I meant that actually. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like you know, it, <laughs> the qualities uh, of these people <laughs> of these people's souls aside, you know, <laughs> which is. It's it's really a fucked up situation, but like you know these alt right like four chan Pepe the the frog people. I mean they are. Yeah. I mean, you know they did go deep into some you know anarchic manifestations of you know of the dark web. You know, and like you you can't really take that away from them. I mean, yeah, no, and which, anonymous came out of out of that, and anonymous yeah. is. Largely a sort of left anarchist group, or it was at least originally, and uh, certainly can be honored for uh, some of the uh, stunts that that they've pulled. So yeah, it's very very complicated yes. mix there. I mean, once you once you uh, go with chaos, you know, you have to uh, expect some uh, weird shit to come your way. <laughs> yeah, right. And this is the weirdest shit ever, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that, that that the president of the United States should 
you know, be uh, uh, listening to bizarro conspiracy theories that probably would have been in uh, uh, counterculture underground magazines 30 years ago or whatever. It's kind of kind of a it's a mind twister. Yeah, lots yeah. of lots of mind twisters these days. It, it is so and through you know in your in your book uh, counterculture through the ages. I mean. I mean, I, this is a very general sort of question because you, you go, you know, I mean, you go way back into, you know, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, mystic uh, counterculture rebels, as you call them, like, you know, Prometheus and Abraham, I mean, you know, Gonks and Socrates and going way, way back then. But like throughout history here and kind of going all the way, you know, that far back into, um, you know, kind of this, the, the global digital future that we're seeing now. Um, I mean, were, were, were there ever sort of, uh, these sort of weird, um, kind of polar opposites existing at the same time in, in, in the counterculture? Or, I mean, it, you know, it feels like, I, I think, I mean, history does repeat itself and, and, you know, maybe there are just some other, you know, equally weird things that happened hundreds of years ago that we're just, uh, you know, we're, we're not realizing. Yeah. I mean, we could have written a book, uh, that I mean, we, we chose to cover 15 or 16, uh, particular historical countercultures. And, uh, we could have gone into a book that could have been more encyclopedic, uh, encyclopedic, and could have taken on some of the uh, weirder, um, you know, perhaps more destructive, you know, murderous, uh, uh, angry countercultures that have existed. I can't think of them right off, right off the top of my head. But there, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always been, been uh, these kinds of things that have risen up and have courted uh, some of the same feelings of. Uh, anti-authoritarianism and of uh, messing with people uh, that we think of when we think of the positive countercultures or the kind of countercultures that we that we like right. but I mean even even within our own experience there's like the Manson family or, or something mm. like that right um, that's and, what I mean right okay. yeah right. and I mean that's a that that's horrible and also interesting and it's yeah. you know a reflection of another way of looking at uh, being against authority i guess i mean you yeah. know i mean even like if if you look at uh, you know say the fascist uprisings in the 1930s uh i mean they were against moral authority Certainly, the leaders were against moral authority, and you know the uh, the, the idea that uh, a human being with uh, as much uh, power and charisma as Mussolini should just be free to seek as much power as he could possibly get over other people who uh, just didn't have it together. To uh, you know, uh, hmm. so and there's the there's the questioning of the authority of the. Uh, democratic state, the authority of being a decent human, the authority of being nice. Um, you know, question authority says who is <laughs> Morgan Russell wrote in Monday 2000. Uh, you know, and these things can always be twisted into, uh, into uh, peculiar shapes. Where did you, uh, when you, when you wrote that book, um, like where did you draw the line on the sand and, and where to start? I mean, where, where did you kind of come up with, uh, you know, a, a date and time or a specific movement that said, like, okay, maybe this is the or these are the origins of counterculture as as uh, we know it, even though they weren't calling it counterculture back then. Well, but, actually, a, a guy named Leary, uh, your your <laughs> stepdad, and uh, Dan Joy drew the map, um, and I came in and and wrote the book, so. Um, the idea that uh, we would cover uh, Zen, the rise of Zen, the rise of Taoism, uh, Sufism, um, the Enlightenment, the Transcendentalists, uh, Paris, Bohemia in the 1920s or 1910s, uh, all these things uh, came from uh, those two guys, I believe, sitting around in your living room. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, very, I actually didn't know that. Um, I mean, I know that the, the Dan Joy and, and, and my dad wrote the, 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 the forwards, but I, I didn't know that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, you know, looking throughout, throughout man's history. So, I mean, if we're looking at the, the past here and how you guys drew that map and articulated, um, you know, the, the movements and the philosophy w- within that map, where does the future go? What, what, what are you, what are you seeing for, for the future right now in the, in the counterculture, uh, uh, context? I mean, I mean, what, what do you, yeah. I mean, do you have a point of view on it? I know it's kind of, yeah, a- well, I, I mean, I, I think that the, uh, essence of what we described in counterculture, uh, is that it was, uh, anti-authoritarian and it was generous Mm. Um, so it wasn't a sort of hard libertarian anti-authoritarianism it was uh, a a anti-authoritarianism of uh, humaneness and uh, uh, compassion but also playfulness and anti-qualities and you know kind of kind of pulling the rug of reality out from under people um, I, I think that there are people who uh, have that spirit who are still out there. Um, I think that uh, that spirit will will again be expressed with uh, a new eloquence, uh, and and you know probably is still being expressed that way actually. And and uh, expressions of uh, this kind of spirit in in, in the arts, um, in popular culture, and possibly in politics and so forth, will uh, uh, probably take hold of some imaginations at, at some point in the future. I mean, these things come in waves. I think I was telling somebody uh, that the 70s and the 90s were the hedonic decades, and and, and people who uh, were have really become adults after, uh, after 9-11 – and then after the crash of the economy and, and you know, taking your shoes off uh, at the airport and helicopter moms and being searched at schools and so forth, you really can't know what it was like uh, living without at least a little bit of a stick up your ass uh, uh, <laughs> as, as a result of this kind of social crisis that, that we're in. Uh, but I think, you know, people, people are strong. Young people are strong. And creative, and uh, uh, perhaps there will be another emergence of uh, uh, these kinds of celebratory uh, epochs once once again. Uh, I, I, th- I think when when you have economic austerity uh, to the degree that you have in the 21st century, it's very hard to credit the uh, kind of uh, bohemianism that uh, we did in the 1990s with social consciousness uh, so that if you're self-indulgent, people are going to look at you cross-eyed um, and say, well, that's, you know, times are serious, uh, to quote my last name. Um, <laughs> and, and that, you know, this kind of style of living that uh, uh, was very self-indulgent uh, is not the thing of, of the moment. Uh, but I think, I think they, you know, the quality of uh, being able to enjoy yourself uh, and also transform the world, you know, is something that uh, keeps on popping up and will uh, pop up again and again. And, you know, one day, one day it might get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it might land on the right number one day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so do you maintain them? Um, uh, do you do you view yourself uh, as an optimist? I mean, given the the insanity, the current insanity that that we're seeing, uh, do you maintain optimism or? No, you know? I mean, I, I just spoke optimistically. I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't, you, did, you did. That's what that's. I, I, I don't mean. generally maintain optimism. In <laughs> fact, uh, I, I I write really depressed song lyrics, and you know, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. For I, the most for the most part, I I, I like. To be critical now, I really prefer being critical to uh, sort of any kind of yeah yeah let's let's be upbeat uh, you know the the world is on our side kind of uh, thinking. I think it's very important to uh, 
look at things critically and, and apply a sharp intelligence to it. Uh, but I try not to be too pessimistic because, you know, there's always uh, uh, the possibility that uh, things will will emerge into into a better situation. Yeah, I, 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 I like to think that, too. Um, OK, well, all, all of that aside, sort of, the you know, the cultural schism that we're experiencing, the last thing I, I, I did uh, I want to ask you is like, what do you think is um, in terms of sort of, uh, you know, kind of brewing subcultures or emerging tech or, you know, psychedelic visionaries or anything like that? What, what's the coolest thing happening out in the world today that kind of excites you? Boy, uh, I don't know if there is anything. I mean, there's there's uh, there's the mainstreaming of psychedelics through maps and so forth. Yeah. Um, and you know, the the medicalization of marijuana led to the legalization of marijuana or the decriminalization of marijuana yep. in a lot of places. And uh, maybe something like that will happen with the psychedelics, and and maybe that will raise the uh, levels a little bit. Uh, but I don't. I don't think there's a specific thing going on right now that's way awesome. You know. <laughs> uh, you know. I, I don't really. I don't really think so. I think we're we're in this uh, peculiar place. I mean, I I guess that it after I quit Mondo in 1992, I guess that it did uh, an issue in 1996, and I wrote an editorial saying a farewell to decade defining zeitgeist and claimed that there was no zeitgeist anymore. Um, but, I mean, even in terms of subculture, I'm not, I'm not seeing a, a specific thing to, uh, to get excited about. But, I mean, you, you know, your, your stepdad is gone, and he was the man of uh, vast enthusiasms and excitement. So uh, hmm. we don't have somebody around to uh, get us all excited about something right now. So I have to find it for myself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he definitely maintained. Uh, God, I, you know, just this 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 sense of joy and playfulness. Um, yeah. Like constantly. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah, and I look, and it's just like, look at this, you know, cyberpunk. Yeah. Look at this, you know. Look at the look at the next thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, but also, I mean, uh, you know, in, in that context, but also just from a like a personal. Uh, oh yeah as well i mean you know he could, yeah. he could suffer the most brutal setback personally but you know come through it grinning <laughs> really yeah really fast yeah um so what what's next for you what are you working on um well i'm doing a bunch of music stuff with various people um that's kind of what i'm really most excited about and most in, engaged in uh, and I want to invite anybody out there who's a musician to uh, contact me as as well because I'm trying to do it with a wide variety of uh, different people I expect to have a couple of new songs out really soon and there are some songs now on Bandcamp look up Are You Serious on Bandcamp um, so, so that's one thing and there's the ongoing Monday 2000 History Project uh, which eventually has to be uh, finished and, and made into a book and uh, that's long in process and uh, it's quite a quite a tale to tell it's uh, it's uh, quite a quite a strange story i think that uh, more so than anyone might even suspect unless they uh, actually met <laughs> queen mu <Moo> or uh, <laughs> or stara or some other people like that you know Oh man! Well, when you have music, uh, yeah, let's. Uh, I'll definitely blast out some some music to my mailing list, and um, right. maybe, maybe we could play a song on the intro to this podcast too. That'd be cool. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah email me something. Are you? Thanks for doing this, man. It's been great. 